Cool. Hey. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, everybody can hear me even in the back? Show my hands. Cool. All right. Well, welcome to the MIT uh, Bitcoin Expo 2018, the fifth annual version of the conference. Uh, this is actually special for me. This is my first time at an MIT Bitcoin Expo, even though I am from Boston and I have been in the space since 2013. Uh, so really special time for me. My first Bitcoin meetup was actually down the street. If you guys know a restaurant called Veggie Galaxy, I'm not sure they're still accepting Bitcoin. Uh, might try to find that out this weekend. Uh, but again, yeah, so my name is Pete Rizzo. I'm the editor-in-chief for Coindesk, the largest media and events uh, business in the space. We do charge $2,000 for the tickets to our events, just full disclosure. Uh, and you can read all our stories at coindesk.com. Those are free. Uh, so my guest today is Joey Ito, the director of MIT Media Lab. Applause. And the person responsible for helping create uh, the MIT Digital Currency Initiative, which launched in 2015. So uh, we have a titleless talk today, a fireside chat. I've without, decided without to- Without a fire. Without a fire. We can draw one up. <laughs> can we get an image on the board? No? All right. Um, so we're going to give it an informal title, Making Sense of Crypto Today. Okay. That's, what, that's what I'm going with. Uh, just to give everybody, you know, before two days of technical talks to kind of wrap our heads around where we are, where we've been. So Joey, I wanted to pick up with something with the last talk that I saw you give, which is at Scaling Bitcoin. Uh, in November of last year, uh, you said that today is more like 1989 mm -hmm. in Bitcoin. So since then, Bitcoin has gone up to $20,000. The market cap almost reached a trillion, talking about price. Mm -hmm. Katy Perry painted her fingernails with Bitcoins. Venezuela, an actual nation, claims they're going to launch a cryptocurrency. So with that, first question, is it still 1989, is it still early? So, so <laughs> I, I'm gonna be You're the gonna old, I'm gonna be the old guy here, okay? And, <clears throat> um, and I'll also give a disclaimer that my first real main thing and my continuing main thing is working on the internet. So from my position, almost everything looks kind of like the internet. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the internet, um, the number of hosts connected to the internet from like the 80s, there's a really smooth curve. It, mm. with almost no bumps. It's just completely uh, smooth. Mm. And if you look at the stock price, mm. it goes up and down, up and down, and up and down. And there's a point where after the bubble, the NASDAQ goes back to before the internet even mm. existed. So, so if you look at certain indicators, the sort of the development of the internet was extremely volatile. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, it went to Super Bowl ads before it went back to zero. Mm. Um, but if you look at the technical development of the internet and sort of the real numbers, which are connected hosts, it, it was completely like, you know, c clear. And, and I think it's similar with cryptocurrencies broadly. I mean, I do think that there's more attention, so there's probably more money going into some, there's some trickle down mm -hmm. into the technology. But, you know, when, when I, like in 90, I'm trying to remember what year it was. I think it was around 96 mm -hmm. that I opened a Mark Twain account to get my uh, gold backed digicash running, mm. and I was selling music on my uh, uh, server uh, with, with digicash in 96. Mm. And I remember doing an interview in 1996 saying, cryptocurrency is going to be the next big thing. And I wrote mm. this book called Digital Cash. And, and to me, it's the, you know, we've, you know, all of the technology has gotten better. All the core technology and the Satoshi paper, you know, are things that have been around for a long time. So, so from a technical perspective, I feel like we're kind of chugging along. We still have some fundamental problems we need to figure out. And, um, and I think that the long-term outlooks are very bright. So, the, so that's kind of looking at it from the technical level. So, so in a, in a short sense, answer early on the technology. I, I think so, yeah. And, and it, in the parallel to, to internet that I would use is, it is, and this may be wrong, right? So just, uh, but, the, but how I parse it is, I remember before we had, uh, Ethernet. Um, we, I, I remember plugging, like, my Macintosh couldn't talk to my, my uh, Windows machine, and we had Novell Networks and Token Ring and, uh, and Apple Talk and, 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 and all kinds of networking things, both at the physical layer and at the, at the addressing layer. And, and then I remember the day that I could download uh, TCPIP to both my Mac and my uh, a Windows machine, and then they could suddenly start to talk to each other. And there was this sort of interesting feeling as um, uh, 
st things started to become interoperable and people started to uh, rally around standards that weren't necessarily the best standards and they were the ones that the community decided, hey, we're gonna hang out here. And, and I think what, one thing that's really important is I think it's, a lot of it is about a consensus of a community. It's not really winning a technical argument, mm -hmm. which is I think one, one thing. And then it also, if you look at the companies, not talking specifically mm -hmm. about market price, but if you look at Cisco, for instance, which became the largest company in the world at one point, that was a bunch of people who were working in academia saying, okay, I think we've fixed on the standard TCPIP. And they ran out of Stanford and started a company. And 3Com is very similar. So Bob Metcalf say, hey, this ethernet is gonna be a thing. I was involved in the standard. I can build the thing that's gonna be the standard. So if you look at the biggest companies that were created on the internet, it was usually after somebody or a community had kind of locked in the, the, the protocol for that layer. I feel like it's still like Novell Networks and Apple Talk and Token Ring and where is the layer? Are these three layers one layer or are they three layers? We're still having that conversation. Now, it may be that we don't converge, but it still feels a lot like it. I still remember when we had multiple email systems. So we had like uh, the DEC system, we had the source, we had CompuServe, we had Usenet, and we used to just route email. And everybody's, oh, you know what? It's gonna be a network of networks. We're gonna call it the internet. And we're gonna have all of these interoperable networks and X25 will still survive. Well, they, credit card companies still use it. But, but for the most part, at the beginning, it felt like we had all these exchanges that would like route mail, and it seemed, oh, we got it, it's done. But it turned out that once TCP IP locked in, it just became easier and easier just to use IP addresses for more and more stuff. And once the domain name system kind of got locked in, uh, people started to use that. And, and after that, forking became hard. I remember when I was on the ITM board, um, the Arab League tried to fork. I remember when the Chinese tried to fork, but you just had so many people who knew how to run the internet that it didn't really make sense to duplicate. Uh, the, it, it, it was, it's not, and it's really kind of just this experience of fending off attacks, experience of dealing with bugs, ex experience of um, dealing with irate customers. And so, so I feel like there are these sort of local maximums that you get in different communities. And, and I don't think we're, I don't feel that yet. I mean, I feel like we're all kind of in the same room talking, but we were doing that before we standardized. And so, so again, this is just an old guy talking from like, you know, about internet wars, wars, um, yeah, I'm 50, 51, so oh. half a century. <laughs> but but um, so, so that's, that's my intuition. Now, there are differences and there are a lot of great articles and speeches I've read about how it's different from the internet and so, and, and, there, and we can go into those. But to me, that, that's, that's what I feel. And then from the market's perspective, you know, you know, this isn't the first time everybody was excited about cryptocurrencies. Right. Um, it might not be the last time. And um, so, so I, I just try not to pay too much attention to the details. Um, I do think it's unfortunate that I think a lot of people will be harmed because right. you have kids buying well, stuff. Let me, ask so, this question. Yeah. let me ask this question a little bit differently. It seems that since uh, your last talk, crypto has become cool. That's a cool mainstream thing. I'll use the words. <laughs> I'll use. I'll use the words of my girlfriend. Uh, Bitcoin is a thing now. Mm -hmm. So, do you feel that there is a culture problem here? You see these sort of big, like Katy Perry nails, this Hodler Lambo yeah. kind of culture. So, so, I guess that was sort of my point about the 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 the. the if you look at stock price versus internet hosts. Mm -hmm. Society always overshoots, right? So they overshot by becoming too excited by dot com, and then they undershot by thinking that actually the internet wasn't worth anything. It'll kind of zigzag until it it sort of reaches some equilibrium. So, having said that, you can never tell when the the corrections happen, right? So, so I definitely think we're overshooting. I think people are way too excited about the production level. Uh, usability of the blockchain. I, I think we're, we should be doing proof of concepts, not full-scale projects. And I think that there's so much money that has gone into startups that have promised so much stuff that can't be done. And I personally believe that's where a lot of the friction between the developer community and uh, reality is, is the developers are, I think, the, at least the, the ones that I, I, I talk to, are, are fairly conservative about what they think the deployment speed is. And then you've got businesses that just want high returns immediately. And then you've got people in the middle trying to push the developers to go faster and do more. And then you either get developers who don't give a shit and build kind of 
crappy stuff. Or you get people who are like, we don't really care what you say, we're gonna go at our speed. And I feel like that's, that's, gonna, that's causing problems. And then the, so, so anyways, the short version is I think it's overrated right now. And I think it's sort of dangerous, but it, you can just sort of ignore it and keep going. And then, you know, it, it'll get, like to me, the, my favorite time, like th that I was for, whether it was investing or building, was after the internet bubble popped. I was in Silicon Valley, all the scammy people were gone. Um, all of the smart people were unemployed, trying to figure out new things. This is blogging, by the way. The reason blogging took off was we had so many really smart unemployed people that we were, they were either writing blogging platforms or they were writing blogs. And, they, and, and so there's lots of really cool conversation going on because people had a lot of time. And, and, and all the crappy people were gone. And so in Silicon Valley, you could have a party post bubble and all the interesting people would show up and we'd sit around and talk about, well, what do you think about? And that's when we had, we were able to make really interesting standards like, um, you know, trackbacks and I mean, all the bubbles. And right now it's really hard because. I think it's interesting too, because it's, um, you know, even the introduction here where there's, uh, it seems like we want to split the technology and the market. But in this sense, the technology is the market. I mean, I think, um, you know, I'm not going to lie, even as someone who's been in this space, uh, $20,000, it, it felt good. It felt like validation. It felt like people were paying attention. Mm -hmm. It felt like a, an achievement. And so you're in, but we still have this culture where um, I think it's okay to do development. Uh, maybe it's not okay to be a hodler. It's not okay to do this displays yeah. of wealth. So how do, you, how do you divide those two well, things? How do you say I, they're yeah. not? I, I, yeah, I'm, just, I'm, I'm gonna just play the role of being broadly negative on the, on the finance <laughs> stuff, just because I think the other problem with when you're in a bubble is stuff goes up just because there are people buying it, not because it's good. And so I'll just take a completely different field. If you look at uh, my, I'm, so my generation was during the bubble in Japan. So most of my classmates went into investment banking and the market was going up so fast in real estate and other things. So you could actually not be doing anything, just like taking, buying one thing and selling it to somebody else. And so for a decade, a lot of my classmates absolutely learned nothing did no, provided no value and were validated for being completely useless. And what happened is, then they became, then they became broke, <laughs> yeah. they had no skills, and they had no idea of how to learn anything useful. And, and the problem with the dot-com bubble, so like pets.com is like the, uh, the poster child for that, but they were buying stuff and selling it at 30% of the price because they were trying to increase market share. So for some reason during the internet bubble, um, market share and traffic was the measurement, not revenue or earnings, right? And, and what happens is you get a very skewed sense of reality. And, the, and the, the concern that I have, leaving the people aside, is you create all these business models that don't really make sense in a rational market, in an irrational market. So we're wasting developer resources, we're wasting money, and the worst thing that could happen is this thing could keep going for 10 years and then it could say, oops, we were wrong, and then suddenly everybody's time, skills, energy, business models turn out to be kind of not that interesting. So to me, some of the best companies are built, even Google, even though it was created before the, 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 the bubble crash, um, it, it was tough. It was toughened up during the tough times. And I think that it's during tough periods that companies sort of build their resilience and their strength. So, so I think it's harder to build really strong companies or really strong people when you, you can just make money by trading. And so having, having said that, you know, I, I think some validation is, is important. I just think that when you, when anything, there's another, one last thing I'll say is that on this is that there's a, um, I'm trying to remember who it was. There's a very famous investor who said that the worst possible thing for a public company CEO is to have their stock price overpriced. Mm. And that's why you see the big companies always trying to get their price, stocks underpriced. Because if you're overpriced, then people will get upset when it goes down. And that's how you get fired as a CEO. And people are always happy if the stock price is going up. And when PSINet, which I ran the Japanese subsidiary of, and I, I think I can say this now because it's been a while, I mean, when, they, when we went bankrupt, um, two people came to try to kill the CEO because they had lost wow. so much money. So when, when markets correct, people get upset. People lose their houses and things like that. And there's, there's really no way, it's really easy to get happy when it's going up, but going down really sucks. And so I think it's really important to try to maintain a non-overpriced market with rational prices because otherwise, 
I mean, it's not just that people get harmed, people get mad. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I'm, I'm worried yeah, about that yeah. as well. So I guess, um, you know, as a takeaway for the people in the audience, uh, how do you uh, feel, do they have a responsibility, do we have a responsibility as a community to, you know, mitigate the sort of Lambo culture? Like, what, 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 what do we do to get people to, you know, look, there's a ton of people who are interested in the technology now. Yeah, yeah. They're interested because everyone is presumably making money. We're all rich, right? You guys are all rich? <laughs> right, right. Okay, some nods. Uh, so what, what do we, <laughs> a lot of Lambos out there. Uh, so what do, what do we, what do we so, do as a community well, to sort of say that this so, is wrong or this isn't? Right? So we, you don't want to be Pets.com, right? So Pets.com ran Super Bowl ads, mm -hmm. and they were so out there flaunting this sort of false business model that they still look like idiots. You remember them decades later. So I think that you know the, the market is what it is, and if people want to take advantage of it or use it rationally, fun. But I think if you're pumping it or fanning the flames or you're running around <laughs> flaunting it, you're going to look like a real idiot later. Um, and you're the guy that people might blame for having them go into a market that then goes down. So I think if nothing else, this is just personal advice, yeah. you know, flaunting, fanning or overselling like business models that only work in bubble markets, that's a really bad idea. I think people either get upset or, or you will look like an idiot. And I think that just take being kind of prudent about it and saying, look, we're in this kind of market. I'm going to do a startup. I'm going to raise money while I can and go for it. I, I can't blame people for that. Um, but I mean, you know, being where I am, I, I, I think the long game, again, I would rather be the founder of Cisco than the founder of CompuServe or AOL. And that's kind of where we are right now. We're building AOLs and CompuServe's because we're building on top of an unestablished uh, 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 infrastructure and it may be that these things fundamentally change and then you're gonna have a bunch of sunk costs in old infrastructure and I still remember the day that AOL said you know what we're gonna become a website not a portal not a closed community they had to change their whole business around I think that we're still we may, I may again I may be completely wrong but I still think that if you are pouring tons of money building a whole operational thing when all these things are still in flux, um, it's, 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 still, it's still risky. Yeah. Well, I want to come back again to behavior. So uh, you made an interesting choice recently. Uh, there was an incident with a certain blockchain community. It was IOTA. It, yeah, I, it, uh, I don't know if it's strictly a blockchain, but yes, well, a, a tangle. <laughs> I'm, I'm, using, a tangle. <laughs> I'm using that word in the, the I guess, uh, uh, the, the CoinDesk word. <laughs> the CoinDesk version. Um, so you wrote an op-ed. Uh, in which you sort of took down an MIT uh, technology review article about them. So is that the kind of behavior should people look to call out bad behavior? Is that the kind of action that you Call out the behavior like of the tech review being uh, stupid? Or just when or you I'm on the board of tech review, but I'm <laughs> separate from the editorial. I, I, either <laughs> or. So I guess maybe take us through why did, you, why did you do that? Why did you think it was helpful? Is this something people should do more of if we do have this culture problem that you're talking about? Yeah, I don't know if it's related to culture. I mean, that was a fairly straightforward decision. Um, our team had written up uh, uh, a, a memo about some vulnerabilities that we found. Um, the tech review, I thought, wrote an article that was not very accurate and unfortunately they hadn't talked to us and so but the problem and this is kind of a broader problem i mean we have the bitcoin club we've got the digital currency initiative we've got random people i mean mit has so many different things it's more like an ecosystem but to the internet they think the tech review is mit they think we're mit so there was a lot of confusion about that article being inconsistent with what the dci had found so i just wanted to clarify that we didn't agree with the tech review and we thought that the reporting wasn't very good um, and so that was that was the purpose of the thing that I wrote was just I didn't say anything new other than just reinforce that because well, we I thought it was rare you guys haven't really as a body sort of taken a stand against something before or... um, no well, we, we've we've done a lot of responsible disclosures mm -hmm. um, and we do them um, openly we do them properly and several companies that we've talked to have done very responsible responsible re responses to responsible disclosures <laughs> the only reason the IOTA thing sort of took its own life was the response was much more public and vocal. And so it turned into a thing. But I, I don't, we weren't, we just wanted to share with them what we, we saw and it, and it just became a thing, wow. you know. So you don't see it as being tied back to the culture because, you know, I know that the forums were not, well, the IOTA forums were not kind to your, yeah. uh, I, your comments and your research. Again, I think it's more about them. I mean, I think that, that um, other 
people that we've talked to about their issues, and some of them have been public, and I don't really want to call them out because I think they were responsible. Um, you know, they responded, and, and, and their communities didn't go crazy, and it was fine, right? And I think that in their case, they have a particular character. I don't know how representative they are of the average of, of, of cryptocurrencies. I feel like they might be a little bit more aggressive. Um, but, 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 I, but I do think that one of the peculiar pieces about these cryptocurrencies is that you have so many people who are invested in keeping the thing up because they've already invested. So that skews the conversation. And, it, and, it's, and it's unfortunate because if you're just a user, you've got an investment because you've bought one thing, mm -hmm. but you sort of want to know what's wrong with it. But if you're in, an, an investor and you've got a ton of money in it, you really don't want people to know necessarily the bad thing until you sold your stuff right and so and and then you're going to hold on to your stuff as long as you can mm -hmm. until people until you don't right so it's just it i think the 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 the, the sort of reddit twitter and then the 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 market cap thing um unless the 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 developers are leaning into it it will tend to create a a a bias mm -hmm. of, of of the kinds of conversations you have yeah, I think that's one of the interesting things that we have, uh, you know, I think you, you made a lot of comparisons to the internet, but now we have the internet fueling another technology mm -hmm. and often in ways that it seems like aren't entirely helpful. So you were talking about these Reddit communities uh, that have sprung up. Um, I guess, how do you, how do you see the technology, how do you see the internet playing a role in blockchain development? Is it accelerating things? Is it holding it back? Is it doing both simultaneously? Because it seems like there are both good and bad aspects we have the ability to communicate globally mm -hmm. uh, that's good and bad do you see I guess which which side are you on or how do you see it <laughs> no, I, I mean it's totally good and bad right yeah. and, and I think weirdly the inability to have rational conversations sometimes on the mm -hmm. internet isn't just around cryptocurrencies it's around news it's mm -hmm. around um, everything and I think this is sort of one of the big questions uh, about the future. How do you, and, and, and this ties into the meta meta thing, which is about free speech on campus. It's, it's, it's I'm a huge believer in the First Amendment and free speech. And, but um, we now see the ability to use the internet and other things to try to, to push it, the limits to where some of my friends who have been extremely strong First Amendment people, and even places like EFF and ACLU are starting to lean towards, well, maybe you have to be a little bit more uh, uh, measured in how you apply First Amendment. So, so, so I think this is a really interesting period where the conversation itself has become a technology and a tool, mm. and, and then and a certain class of people have a, a better proficiency at manipulating or at least sort of directing it. And, um, and so, so, so I think it's the crypt cryptocurrency space is a really interesting place to look because you do see sophisticated uses, mm -hmm. and, 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 but, but I think it's a, it's a meta problem. It's, it's huge and it's really interesting. The, the concern that I have is I don't think, it may be that it never goes back. Mm -hmm. um, I heard one person who I can't attribute, but a very senior security person for one of the platforms say that it, it really is like cybersecurity where um, we're never going back to a time when it's not really a problem, you know, and that there will always be attacks, and we'll always be coming out with patches, and that um, the internet, the idea that the internet is always good, it's always going to be good and bad, and we're going to be trying to deal with the bad, you know. So let's move on to something that I think uh, you've kind of staked your claim on being bad. That's the initial coin offering model. For those who aren't familiar, there are companies and projects uh, minting their own cryptocurrencies, selling them in, the, in these big elab elaborate sales. Uh, you said in November that they are attracting the wrong people. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see, uh, have, you, have you been surprised at, the, at the, how the model has continued to gain traction? Yeah, and, and I, th I think the SEC is finally moving on them, mm -hmm. and um, I think they've subpoenaed a huge number of them right now, so I think there's going to be some enforcement around them, and for those of you who haven't seen, there's a, 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 the, 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 the Munchie, uh, mm, yeah, Munchie movement, and, and, and they're, the food they're, blockchain, or yeah, food review yeah, blockchain? Yeah, I, I, I think you write a review, and then you, 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 you get a, token. You get a co coin, then you can t re redeem it, and there's a... Um, uh, and, and so, so, so but, but, the, but, but I think the SEC is thinking about this in the right way, but, but I think my, my main thing, there's two pieces to this that I think are important. One is when you have an irrational market where people are willing to take, and people are willing to buy coins like Ponzi coin, mm -hmm. um, you know that it's kind of a weird market and, and, and any regulation or any sort of thinking about it as if that were normal, you, you don't want to 
regulate for a crazy market, which is what we have right now, where people just, it's just going crazy. Yeah. On the other hand, and, and even, and there are some coins I think that are valid, that are trying to do the right thing, but they're still going to get- any, like what's in it, any examples or? Um, <laughs> no, I don't want to maybe, <laughs> but, but, I so think the but, people on coin market. Yeah, then. but 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 I think I think the the, the main problem for me is that um, if you if you issue a coin, and um, if it's if it's like like if you could just imagine like you, you're a mom and pop shop mm -hmm. and you're issuing a coin to your customers uh, to uh, share in in some sort of uh, you know it's a donut shop and it's just for their customers and and the price is pegged it's it's one coin for a donut and if if the point is not to try to get a market to to go volatile um, you're not going to get speculators and so so the problem is I think any company has a choice of creating a coin that will have very low volatility um, but has a high level of utility but. Investors aren't going to buy that coin. That coin will be useful to the customers. What do you mean they have the choice to do that? So, so for instance, if you're if you're trying to provide a service um, that has some inherent value, like let's say you're selling uh, coffee, right? And if one coin is worth one coffee, uh, and you're just giving the ability to buy it at a slight discount for coffee in the future, or to to lock in the price or something like that, that's that's like a future, right? Uh, that has utility, but only people who are interested in drinking coffee really are going to buy that. Or somebody might try to make a little bit of a market by buying it and then selling it, like uh, like like they'll know there's a surge in coffee and there'll be a diminishing supply, or something like that. But people aren't going to be making thousand x. The thing is, if you unbundle this conversion rate and sort of say, you know what, um, will, the conversion rate will fluctuate, that untethers the, the price of the coin and then the coin becomes a free floating asset that can be ex sold on the exchanges and you can make a thousand X. So if you're an entrepreneur, a VC is not going to buy your coffee coin if there's no volatility because there's no market to sell it at some upshot in, in later. It just becomes utility. So, so, but a lot of companies are trying to use these coins to for utility, but also to raise money. Mm -hmm. and, and you're only gonna raise money if there's upside. And there's only upside if it's untethered and volatile. And so, 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 so there's a, the, and, and that's, that to me is a problem. I mean, of course you wanna raise money for your business, but to sort of link the money raising with the utility and pretend it's just utility, that's to me, uh, and, 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 and even if you sell it to a VC, it feels like, okay, you're selling it to accredited investors. Yeah. Well, those guys are going to go sell it on some market where a bunch of teenagers are borrowing money against their credit cards. So ultimately, there's harm. Uh -huh. and, and again, this is where I get into the irrational markets. If the markets were just a bunch of professional investors who knew what they were doing and were auditing each coin and figuring out the real value, I wouldn't care so much. But right now, because of the whole thing with, with you know, the whole Bitcoin is, is cool thing, yeah. that, that it's, you're, you're, you, you're pumping it into a market that ha is, is ultimately uh, going to get harmed. And I, I feel like that's, that's really knowing, knowingly huh. doing something bad. So I want to move on to a new uh, variation on the ICO model that seems to be uh, sort of a new thing that people are just starting to do, which is the airdrop model. So people seem to be now saying, rather than selling our coins, we're just going to give away value. We're going to create value and distribute it. So I guess a good example of that would have been Bitcoin Cash, which forked and then gave away uh, millions of dollars in value. You can get into whether that was really millions or if that money is really real. But yeah. I guess, how do you see that model where now it's we're not raising money with coins, we're now sort of creating money out of thin air and just distributing it? Is that it different? Is it be better? Or? This is going to date me, but you know, they used, AOL used to send you like free CDs. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's just it's just marketing. I mean, I think it's 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 fine. It's just good old fashioned marketing, and it's so a distrib distri uh, distributing a coin is fine. Yeah, and it's just the raising of money that. Well, yeah, but but even distributing coin, I think I think okay, I, I, what. Well, Everybody here has some friend of theirs that knows nothing about cryptocurrency, has no ability to value it, who's probably buying it when they shouldn't, right? I mean, I think everybody sure. can raise their hand. Yeah, they know people yeah. like that, right? And if the market went down, they would be harmed, and they would be harmed because they've been, you know, they've unintentionally bought something that wasn't actually worth what it actually should be worth. And so, so I think that if you know this, and you're, even if you airdrop it, what's happening when you airdrop it is then it's, people are going to buy it and sell it. And it's gonna, it's, you're just feeding a frothy market of where 
you know, because when you look at the, the, and this is, and again, I'm not blaming anyone specifically, but when you look at an exchange and you see all these charts and these, these memos, and it, it looks like a, like a currency market or like a stock market. So obviously when kids buy and sell it, they think that these, there's something t going on. And, 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 and it's really misleading. I think the way that we talk about them, the fact that they have ticker symbols, it's really, really misleading and making people feel like it's a real currency. And also that, you know, the, and, and Wall Street's not good because Wall Street has always kept normal people out of good investments. So they think, oh, these are really good investments that I'm kind of being kept out of, but this is my way to get into how real people make money, or at least that's how people sell it, right? And so, so I think that, that even when you tell them, hey, don't invest, this is dangerous, they say, oh, you're just trying to trick me from investing in something that's gonna make a lot Can of money. Can you really, right? I guess, invest if you're just receiving something for free, is that? No, well, no that's, my, so, so, so you receive something for free, but what happens is it's feeding a market that then turns later into a machine where people will buy and sell, right? So, so it's not like, I don't think, again, each person is, is just sort of doing one thing that contributes to an ecosystem that's, that's a little bit crazy. And, and, you know, and, and I think if you're kind of either libertarian or, or just sort of laissez-faire, you can say, well, it's their own damn fault for falling for this and they're gonna get harmed and that's the cost of innovation. And, and I think that's not irrational. But I think the extent to which, you know, you sleep well at night or not, you should be kind of thinking, you know, you should imagine all the people who are taking out credit card loans right now and buying this stuff uh, and trying to decide what your contribution to that, that is, you know. That's interesting. I've been talking a lot about the airdrop model uh, with the, uh, you know, uh, kind of people in the community. One person I talked to recently, a guy named Joseph Poon, uh, creator of the Lightning Network or with Taj Drages also here. Um, his quote was, uh, my belief is that societies can run off gift economies due to blockchain. Uh, paraphrasing what he said is that we, we are now creators of wealth. We can now distribute wealth. We can give all this yeah. money. So you don't see this as something that maybe this is almost anti-capitalism. Well, yeah, new... so, so let me rephrase this. So <laughs> if the market became rational, uh -huh. right, I think I, I would have a whole different set of beliefs. I think a lot of, I, I think ICOs are great. I think airdropping is a cool idea. All, all these things are fine. You say ICOs are great. Yeah, I think ICOs well designed in a rational market are really, really interesting. And long term, I think ICOs are a, a great thing. And so, so I'm not anti-ICO. I'm anti the way people are doing ICOs now. I'm anti the way people are buying ICOs. I'm anti the way we're marketing ICOs. I'm anti the way the ICOs are displayed on exchanges as if they were currencies. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that lead people towards being scammed. And we're all contributing to it by the way we talk about it and the way we, we display it. I think ICOs to raise money directly, I think is a great idea, you, but you need to figure out how do, are people informed, how are valuations done, how, how, how do we do it in a responsible way, right? And, so, and, then, and then on the alternative currency stuff, I think it's really interesting. I'd be much more interested in a cryptocurrency that was not transferable to any other currency, for example, right? Something that is non-negotiable. Something like, for instance, if I gave uh, a, a thousand coins to every MIT graduate when they got their degree, and they gave those coins to people that helped them during their degree program, and that could never be exchanged to money or else it became void, mm -hmm. and it became a currency that had nothing to do. It's kind of like Warcraft Gold. Warcraft Gold, although you can buy it on the internet, like in my guild, you would get kicked out of our guild if you bought gold. Because if I farm all night to make enough gold to buy you your cloak for the raid tomorrow, you have a lot of uh, uh, appreciation for the gold that you got from me because you know I couldn't buy it, right? And so we're not bringing our real life wealth into the game. And that's what made gold valuable in our guild was that it wasn't transferable or exchangeable to cash. And so, so I think there's a bunch of different categories of value. Uh, that that could be interesting. I do also think that the digital currencies are a way to do possibly experiments and things like universal basic income and stuff like that. So I do think that for experimenting with real money, it's also pretty interesting. So I'm not negative about any of these ideas, especially long term. I'm just concerned that we're we're feeding a monster right now. Well, let's talk about Bitcoin. Um... A lot of interesting developments of late, and it does feel like Bitcoin is maturing, I guess, in the face of all these younger, newer ideas. Uh, you know, one of the things I think that might be a major narrative later this year ne into next year is 10 years almost since the network launch. Uh, yeah. Do you think that's going to change people's minds about Bitcoin? I, I, how, how, have, 
How, are, how do you feel about Bitcoin in the context of all these other creations now? Yeah, uh, you know, this is again just my personal opinion, and it, I think we disagree inside even the Digital Currency Initiative and Media Lab. But I'm a pretty firm believer that Bitcoin is most likely to be the sort of long-term winner, um, mainly because just I look at the community size and the uh, rigor of both testing and committing code and running the thing and then the fact that they're fairly narrow and conservative. I think that Ethereum is interesting because you can do a bunch of stuff in Ethereum you can't do in Bitcoin. But to me, um, I just think that the, the, again, this is my personal opinion, that the, the, the size of the community, uh, of, the, of the community at that layer mm -hmm. and the fact that it's, it's, it's layer limited, um, I feel like it's going to be several layers. Um, again, it's, it's not 100%. But, 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 but the main thing is I feel like the community that's around Bitcoin now, not that they're all really good at talking to each other, but, but I do think that you see a convergence. And again, this is kind of the thing when we were doing the internet, um, the ITU kept trying to take over the management of the internet. And even though ICANN was completely dysfunctional and we're always fighting, um, it was the one place where you had the people who, like Paul Vixi, who wrote Bind, and you had the names and numbers people sitting around the table with the government people and the business people, and we would kind of hash things out and we'd figure it out. And it was a, a consensus process that worked. And and um, and again, the Bitcoin community is not working great yet, and I don't know if it will survive. But but I do feel like there's enough expertise there that it will iterate towards very slowly, but iterate towards something that will become a standard. Um, so, so, so I'm very, and, and, and again, a lot of them are, the, the, the folks are here, but a lot of the Bitcoin core developers, some of them don't, but a lot of them don't really give a shit about market cap and stuff like that. They just want to build something long term. And I think you need at least a, a core group of people who are doing that to, um, to, to, to keep it on the rails. I guess a different way to ask that question, uh, you know, gone through a couple have, havings, uh, Bitcoin survived the fork. Um, what's left for the technology to prove in your mind for it to become something that has succeeded? Because I think yeah. I, looking at 10 years, looking at what it's achieved, mm -hmm. what, what's left to build there? Yeah, so I think that what's left to build is this governance model. So I, I think that Bitcoin broadly, their view that we don't really give a shit what the market thinks, we're just going to try to keep working on the technology has served it well. But I do think that you there's... You say that's true, like all the big or the technologists? The technologists, yeah. like the core, <laughs> not, and again, not all of them, but many of the technologists that, that matter. Um, but, but I do think that at some point what you want to do, and they're trying, is to have a conversation about what are the features that we need to add uh, into it to make it more stable. Maybe, like for instance, the security community hasn't been as involved in Bitcoin as it should could or should. Yeah. There's also like the transport layer and there's the next layer up. So, so, the, in, so the really important thing about the, the, in, the layers of the internet is that not only were they creating uh, a standard at their layer, they created uh, communication uh, protocols to the layers above and below. And, and I think that that isn't well formalized. And I think that you know, whether it's a meeting or whether it's a process, you, you do need to have that conversation. And, so, and, and particularly when you start to look at regulators, I, the the core, core software people don't really care about the regulators because they're not running anything and they're not going to be regulated, but the people who use it will be regulated. And so at least understanding what the regulators are concerned about and if you can alleviate some of their concerns with technology so that they don't pass crappy laws to try to prevent you from doing something, that's actually a technical decision that they should decide and they could decide, well, we don't care what the regulators think, but it should be an informed decision. And I think that that process is getting better, but could, could be much better. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to return a little bit to the idea that it's early in the technology, right? So you keep kind of harping on this idea that it's, 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 it's young, we don't know, but also Bitcoin, it's, it's been 10 years, we almost hit a trillion. I guess if it is early, then what is late? What does late look like? Do you, are you sort of starting to conceptualize that? Uh, how yeah. is that? Yeah, I mean, I think late would be maybe we see layer two um, or some sort of layer above it that- You're talking about like lightning now? Lightning or, or something, some, something like that. Like that. Um, and, and you start to see another community and some interoperability conversations. It might be, uh, the, the, I mean, the biggest difference is I think Bitcoin was created by a bunch of people who don't like government and authority, whereas the internet was built by things that were connected to institutions and authorities. So they, they more quickly went into conversation. Um, and, but I do think that that, that will help it. Um, um, 
not have some of the issues that it has. Um, I also, I mean, I, and I, do, I do think that there, it is different in that you can fiddle with the internet more than you can fiddle with uh, cryptocurrencies people's and blockchain, money, yeah. people's money. So, <laughs> so, you know, you could have all these different network protocols competing with each other and then you could say, oh, let's forget that, let's try this. Um, so, so I think that, that it takes longer to uh, develop Bitcoin. I mean, they're, they're going to be slower to adopt new things. They're gonna, it's harder to test things. And so, so I think it, it's, it's taking longer. Um, but, um, but, but, but to me, the maturity really is, is the sort of pieces around it and less, less, less so just the core stuff. I guess uh, ask another way. So how, how do these things fit together? We have all these coins now. We have Bitcoin. We have all this stuff. You know, if you look at CoinMarketCap, we have all this stuff. We have all this code. Mm -hmm. Maybe we don't have a lot of stuff. Maybe it just looks like we have a lot of stuff. How does this stuff come together? Does it at all? Or a lot of this stuff is just a waste and never goes anywhere? Or never, well, never well, there's several categories of stuff, right? So there are, are I think there's too much money going into the, the final application product layer because the lower layers don't really work yet. And so, but- and What's even an the, example of like a product application? I don't know, and, 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 <laughs> any, and all of them. <laughs> it's like, uh, but, but, it's munchy. Yeah, munchy, let's okay. take munchy. And, and, but even pets.com is not a bad idea. There are actually now pet websites that make money and are fine. So, so a lot of the applications that were created during the dot-com are, are perfectly good ideas. And you know, we had video conferencing probably 50 times before Skype took off. So it's not that video conferencing was a bad idea. It was just that the structure and the behavior and the system wasn't ready. So, so experimenting with business models and ideas is not a bad idea. It's just a waste of money for some of the people who are investing. And also, we're very forgetful, so we re repeat the same thing. I, I, I think that the... Um, the, and, and, and there are going to be bits and pieces, you know, as we build layers, like when we were making HTML, you know, Tim Berners-Lee picked a bunch of different things from previous less successful standards to sort of patch together HTML. So, so, so none of this stuff is in waste if you look at it from an academic perspective. The, the, the question is, um, from an investment perspective, is it useful? And also, are we taking important technical resources away from more basic things and having them work too much on sort of spit and polish for applications that don't really make sense. It's, it's a question. I'm not positive about the answer because it's not, the people that are going into applications aren't necessarily the right kind of people to be doing core development. But, um, but, I, but so, so I, don't, I don't have a perfect answer because I don't have perfect visibility. And, and I do think that, you know, like the, the idea of email, you know, it, 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 it's, it tr changed and d different people have run it in different ways. Um, but the idea kept evolving and different features were added along the way. So if you just think about it from the user perspective, a lot of the stuff out there are probably early instances of things that will be successful later. It just might not be credited to the person who's making it now. And it might not be that company that necessarily does it. So it's not, I don't think any of this is a complete So we'll use waste. a munchie token at some point. Yeah, I think, I think something like a munchie is, it totally will make sense. I think, you know, or something like that. And I think we'll learn from it. But I, you know, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be those guys. So uh, you said earlier you're you're 51 years old? Yeah, and I'll be 52 okay. soon. 51. Yeah. So let's take a time machine back and let's say you're just coming out of MIT today. Uh, how do you invest your time? How do you know that something is, is worth it in this environment uh, where maybe you know, Bitcoin is maturing, but there's all these new projects that maybe are going to disappear? What do you what do? You do in that well, so, so I'm very biased right, um, on this one because, um, uh, <laughs> but, but I would spend all of my time trying to understand the uh, either if you, you know, if you're not a Bitcoin person, that's fine. But like Bitcoin Core or Ethereum or trying to understand the real hardcore nuts and bolts. So so I started. Well, I was I didn't by myself start, but I was one of the people who started the first internet service provider in Japan. And I remember we were making, and there were like hundreds of ISPs starting, but there was only one guy in Japan that knew how to do BGP, which is the background protocol for routers. So yeah, so and 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 even this recent, um, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is being built without core developers that really understand security or understand what's really going on inside. And so, so I think you can make yourself a really valuable asset by learning a couple of the core things that are going to be essential for anything that you build. And so I think going deep, if, you have, if you're technical, going deep into the core technology and being part of the Cisco rather than part of the, the CompuServe, even though CompuServe looks exciting right now, I think, I think your, your return on it and get, becoming part of the technical community and understanding the code really, really well 
will yield returns. And I think the time to invest, right now it's, it, it may keep going up, so you know, people might get mad if I tell them not to go in and then it keeps going up, but, but it's always better to start at a, a bottom mm. than it is to start at a top or start on the way up. And so to me, I would, would be less focused on starting a company right now, mm. unless the company is teaching you a bunch of stuff and is very technical um, and more involved in trying to understand the technology because if there is a correction and it goes mm. down, that's the time to, to, to start a company. But, but your mileage may vary on my <laughs> advice. So uh, <laughs> running out of time here, uh, final thought. Um, we have, it seems like as a community, we have attention now. We have interest. We have John Oliver's 30-minute uh, television show. Uh, we have achieved a mind share that was not there before. Uh, what is at stake for you looking at the next year? Now that we have that attention, what, do we have a responsibility to translate into something? I guess what, would you, what advice would you give to the people here who are looking to sort of power that or turn that into something? Um, again, it's, I, this is going to end on a kind of negative note, but but I, I, <laughs> I, I just that would be really yeah, inspiring. I just, I just very, think I just think yeah. that that well, from my perspective, and then I can tell everybody, like I I was just up in Washington today. I'm not going to give out the details, but I'm trying to prevent uh, governments from overreacting and sort of clamping down on uh, some of the problems that we're causing or are, are being. Are happening. This is uh, the loss of. Yeah, yeah. I, so I, I think that the, the worst case scenario is that it zooms up, it crashes, a bunch of regulations come in, and we stifle innovation for a long time. Um, and I think that we can help by being responsible about the way we talk about it, about the way we're excited about it, um, about flaunting. Because I think mm. just like flaunting wealth is kind of stupid because it makes people around you sort of feel like you know, wait, what should I be doing that? So, so this kind of like, like um, bubble thing, I think it's, it's just, it's just you do it quietly if you're gonna make money. Um, <laughs> and, 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 I, and I do think that thinking about your company, um, and so, so imagine that all this attention goes away, um, will my company survive? Like build a company that will survive even if Bitcoin goes down to 10% of what it is now, when no more investors are coming and no more attention is there. I think that's pretty interesting. And, and also, even if you're not doing it, try to look at companies and try to, even if you understand that the market's here, try to figure out ways to value it. So one of my friends um, uh, was an investor in, in, in um, land in Japan. And what he did was, even though there's a bubble where the price of land just kept going up, and then people started buying and selling land without thinking about the underlying value. And when it started to crash, it went into free fall because no one was able to price property anymore because they had lost that skill. But there were a few investors that knew how to do the math to price the value of underlying properties and they bought up all the land because they were able to offer prices. And then they became really rich because once it bounced back, they owned everything. And so, so, so I think being able to rationally value products, technology and things in an irrational market will be very valuable in the long run when you're trying to figure out, okay, what parts do we save? What company do I join? Um, if, if you're an investor, what do I, if you, if, or if you've made a lot of money in Bitcoin, what companies do I buy up? But, but trying to keep a rational mind in an irrational market, I think is kind of this way to survive sort of longer term. Exciting times, Joey. Right, thank thanks you. Thanks for the talk. Good luck. And thanks everybody for listening.